Good morning. We hope you're all having a wonderful experience here at day two of Endo 2018, the Endocrine Society's 100th annual meeting and expo in Chicago. I'm Jenny Glenn Gingery. I'm the Associate Director of Communications and Media Relations for the Endocrine Society. Uh, we're here to talk about some of the top reproductive health abstracts being presented at the meeting. We're very pleased to have with us Stephanie Page, Professor of Medicine from the University of Washington. I'm an Al Hendy, Professor of Gynecology and Director of Translational Research from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Alberto Fairlin, Associate Professor of Endocrinology from the University of Brescia in Italy. Over the next 25 minutes, our speakers will be sharing the findings from their studies. We'll have one Q&A session at the end of all of the presentations. Please note that this news conference is being broadcast live via webcast, and that there are many journalists online with us right now. Because we are broadcasting over the web, it's very important to make sure you speak into the microphone so that people tuning into the webcast can hear you. Um, journalists who are attending online can type their questions into the chat function um, during our Q&A period. Uh, and everyone in the room, please make sure that you wait for the microphone to come around before you ask a question. I would now like to invite our first presenter, Dr. Page, to the podium. Thank you so much, and I'm so excited to be presenting the results of um, our newest study, which is really a big step forward in the development of the male pill. It's important to note that this study is a joint um, adventure between ourselves and UCLA, led by Dr. Christina Wang, and we're sponsored by uh, NICHD, and our program officer, Diana Blythe, is also here today. Uh, you may have heard her speak yesterday at the plenary session. So why do we need a pill, male pill, and why don't we have one? So I just want to remind everybody that, the con that contraception is not a solved problem worldwide. 40% of pregnancies are still unintended, and about 40% of those end in terminations. And so that's an enormous economic and health cost for men and women across the world. Men really only have two options for contraception. Our last great advance in male contraception was 300 years ago with the development of the condom. And I think while there are nice surgical methods for reversing vasectomy, we all know that that's not really a reversible form of contraception. We're often asked if there was a contraceptive, are men really interested in using it? And there's been very nice work in this area demonstrating that men across the globe um, of various ethnicities, races, and across socioeconomic groups are actually very interested in contraception. And 60 to 80 percent of men surveyed in such studies actually say if there was a reversible contraceptive available, they would be very interested in using it. When you ask these same men what type of contraceptive they'd like to use, most of them would like to use a pill as opposed to an implant or an injection. So we really think that the development of a male pill is important in getting men more involved in contraception. So if it's so important, why don't we have one? Um, so there's been quite a bit of work you may know about in the area of male contraception, and there have been a couple real major challenges. One is that in all of those really effective regimens, we have to use two different steroids. So both an androgen, usually testosterone, and a progestin, similar to what's used in the female pill. Secondly, oral testosterone delivery, which is what one would need to develop a male pill, has been incredibly challenging. The testosterone preparations that are available orally here in the United States can cause liver toxicity, and the they also have to be dosed more than once a day, even the newer ones that are in development. It's hard enough to remember to take a pill once a day, so a pill that one would have to take twice a day really isn't feasible for a contraceptive. So what's new about dimethandrolone? Why is this so interesting and exciting? So dimethandrolone is actually a modified form of testosterone wherein there's been chemical modification to get rid of the problem of liver toxicity. And a long, acting, a long fatty acid chain has been added to another portion of the molecule to increase its absorption in the bloodstream so that we can get around this twice a day dosing. Thirdly, uh, dimethandrolone is different than testosterone because it binds both the progestin receptor and the androgen receptor. So here we think we have a single agent. We won't need two different steroids in order to have an effective male contraceptive. So how, do male, how is the male pill going to work? Well, it works just like the female pill. So we take advantage of the natural reproductive loop. So hormones come from the brain, in this case to the testicle, as in contrast to the ovary. That signals the testicle to make testosterone, and that high testosterone environment within the testicle is required for sperm to be produced. In other studies that I mentioned earlier, when you add a testosterone and progestin, 
to the man. This interrupts this loop and blocks the production of these hormones. So here, instead of giving testosterone and a progestin, we just give the one molecule, dimethandrolone. This blocks the signals from the brain to the testicles, so we lose the, the LH and FSH signals. The testosterone production is blocked, and therefore sperm are, are not able to finish their last steps of maturation. Importantly, the dimethandrolone, as I said, is a modified form of testosterone. So even though the man's not making testosterone, if we give the right dose of the dimethandrolone, all of those important sexual, uh, secondary sexual characteristics in the man will be maintained with the dimethandrolone that's in the body. So that's the concept. So what did we do here, and why is this a big step forward? So this is the first time that we've used dimethandrolone for repeated doses in men. So this, again, was a study done at the University of Washington and at UCLA. And the goal here was to determine if multiple doses were safe and to try and identify the right dose and formulation of dimethandrolone to use in longer-term studies. And we were very excited with the results that we, that we found. So just in brief, the study was designed we had, uh, about, we had 100 healthy male volunteers between the ages of 18 and 50. 100 enrolled and 82 completed all of the procedures and were uh, in the evaluable population because they, co they complied with all of the procedures in the study and they took the drug every day. Importantly, dimethandrolone needs to be dosed with food. So in our previous studies, we had determined that the absorption of the steroid was much better with food. And so we instructed all of the participants when they were home to take the dimethandrolone with food. And when they were in the clinic, we observed them dosing with um, predetermined uh, food in a, in a meal that we provided to them. This was a double-blind randomized study. And it was also a dose escalation study. So we started with the lowest dose, we completed all those subjects, and then we went on to the next dose. Uh, and importantly, it had a placebo group, which allows us to compare it to better evaluate any adverse effects that we may have observed. So the big message for us in, this, in the research field is that there really were no significant adverse events or effects. And so that was really the goal of the study, to determine safety. And the men tolerated the drug very well. There weren't common side effects that you get with oral medications like nausea, and we did not see any liver signal. So that was very important uh, for us in this study. This is the data slide that I wanted to show you. So this is the, the portion of the project that looks at how effective the dimethandrolone might be. So on the top panel, you can see the signal from the brain, LH, that I talked about earlier that's required for normal sperm production. And on the bottom panel, you see the serum, the testosterone levels in the blood of the participants. So there's a lot of colors here because we tested a lot of doses. And so I don't want you to focus on that, but rather comparing all the colors with the yellow line up here. So the subjects were dosed on day one, and we actually observed them, since this was an early phase study, in the clinic over 24 hours and measured their blood. So you can see when they just had taken a single dose of the dimethandrolone, the signal from the brain went down a little bit, but it wasn't particularly remarkable. But as the subjects dose the drug every day, which is what's happening here in the middle panel, so these are the days between day one and day 28 of the study, you can see there's a marked reduction in luteinizing hormone in the blood of these individuals, in particular with the highest doses that you see here in blue and green. So importantly, of course, that's just the signal from the brain. Here's the testosterone levels. So even with a single dose of dimethandrolone, you can see that the natural production of testosterone throughout the day actually does fall. But by day seven, the individuals at all the doses had remarkably low testosterone levels. And in particular, at the highest doses that we tested, these testosterone levels were the equivalent to what men experience who have uh, medical castration for prostate cancer, so incredibly low testosterone concentrations. Uh, this was maintained throughout the 28 days. And then most importantly, for young men who might be interested in taking the male pill, uh, when we looked at the individuals a day, at three days and a month later, their testosterone levels had recovered. So this shows reversibility, a key feature of a hormonal contraceptive. And similarly, the levels in the brain also returned to normal. So these were really exciting results for us. This is much uh, more potent than we had expected. And, um, and, we could, and we were able to see all of this with just once a day do dosing. Oops. So, 
could, this could dimethandrol and become the male pill. Well, we're really excited about this because of these results. Importantly, despite these testosterone levels that were incredibly low, men did not have significant symptoms of low testosterone levels. So no hot flashes. The men had a normal mood. We did uh, questionnaires to look at both their mood and their sexual function, and we did not see a signal compared to the placebo group. Uh, they did not have evidence of liver toxicity, and overall, they uh, did not have any significant adverse effects. So we think that's pretty exciting. Uh, we did see some mild weight gain and a little bit of a change in uh, cholesterol levels. These are particular to what's called the good cholesterol, or HDL. Uh, so that may require us to fine tune the dosing uh, and maybe look a little more closely at the formulation. But uh, overall, we were very encouraged about the safety profile of DMAU. So what happens next? So this was a one-month study. Somatogenesis actually takes 75 days. So in a one-month study, we couldn't study sperm endpoints. We couldn't study what we really want to know, which is, uh, was the sperm production um, reduced. But we're pretty confident with these hormone levels that we're going to see that when we do our next study, which is actually just getting underway this month to demonstrate that sperm are suppressed. We know that from all the other work that's been done in this field, that these levels of hormones are adequate to suppress sperm production. So we're, we think this is a major step forward. We're often asked how long till this actually gets to fruition, how long for the male pill. Well, we think this is really accelerating that uh, length of time. We'll be doing the three-month study, as I said. We'll then need to do eventually a study in couples to prove that this actually acts as a real contraceptive. But we're excited to move that project forward in an accelerated fashion. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Page, and Dr. Alhendi will be presenting next. All right, thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for your interest in our work. Uh, we're really excited about it as well. And as you can see from the title, my goal is actually the opposite of Dr. Page. I'm, I'm trying to help women make babies. So, so the title is Making Your Own Stem Cell Therapy of Premature Ovarian Failure. So premature ovarian failure actually has multiple names. It's also called premature ovarian insufficiency, which the community, the scientific community felt is more sensitive for our patients. It's basically premature menopause. That's when uh, younger women uh, ovaries stop working. And as you know, the ovary does two jobs, produce hormones and produce an egg. The hormones come from the ovary. When they stop coming, we can easily replace them externally. And that's how we manage those patients right now. Because as you can imagine, these individuals, when they hit premature menopause, they have all the menopausal symptoms, such as hot flashes, night sweats, uh, painful intercourse, and mood swings, and et cetera. But we can help with that by external hormones. What we cannot help with is to help them get pregnant with their own biological children. Because if the egg cannot produce an egg, really we cannot do anything about it at this point. So uh, by definition, this condition is called premature menopause. And that's when the individual is less than 40 and hit menopause. That, that's the definition of this condition. But as you can imagine, that's become more really relevant when it happens much earlier than that in teens and uh, women in their 20s and early 30s before they have even started their families. Most of the time, uh, it, it's fairly common, so 1% of reproductive age women, and uh, most of the time, the, we don't have a good reason. We don't know why this is happening. So it's called, we call it idiopathic or unknown reason. Uh, occasionally, about 40% of these individuals have abnormal chromosomes, abnormal genes that we can see, but the vast majority would not have an obvious reason. Another name for that particular group is called resistant ovary syndrome, because the ovary resists any kind of stimulation that we can have and we can do nowadays to respond. As you can imagine, it's a devastating condition, especially when it happens in young women who haven't started their family, because at the moment, we cannot uh, help them have a pregnancy. And the only option they have at the moment is to have an egg donation from a healthy individual. And, and as you can imagine, and hence the name of my talk, this child will not be biologically theirs. 
uh, at the moment, there's no treatment for it. And uh, the interesting thing, and that's kind of how uh, we got involved in this, our interest in this many, many years ago, is when we you take a small tissue, a biopsy from the ovary of those individuals, you can see that the eggs are there. These are the follicles or the eggs. They are there, just they are inactive, they are sleepy. They, they, they are there, they haven't disappeared, but they are not active. And again, up to this point, we didn't have any way of activating these eggs to become fertilizable, to be able to make a baby, to make a child. So uh, this condition, many times, like I said, there's no reason, but also sometimes there is a reason. It's, uh, we see this a lot in women who had, were unfortunate to have uh, childhood cancer. Of course, they focus on their cancer treatment, but after they survive the cancer, which usually involve chemotherapy, radiation therapy, and so on, they find that now they have, they survived the cancer, which is fantastic, but now they are infertile. Their ovaries is not working. So, so this is something we have been working on for a long time. This is a paper we published in 2010. Uh, our first attempt was to try gene therapy. It was trying to put some specific genes in the ovary to again activate the ovary. We, uh, we have uh, achieved some success, but it wasn't, wasn't complete. So we kept improving our methods, and then we moved to uh, using stem cells. Initially, we used actually a whole bone marrow with all the contents of the bone marrow. And again, this is 2012, so we're moving forward, making some progress. And also, we achieved some activation. We, we kind of we were able to wake up the ovary a little bit, but not all the way to make uh, babies, to, make, uh, to, to help the female get pregnant. And then we just kept improving our methods as well. So this is from last year, 2017, and this is really the, the study that supported now going into humans. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this study. So in this study, uh, this is done in mice. So we induced ovarian failure in mice to kind of mimic the human situation by giving the mice chemotherapy. And then we actually treated these mice with human bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, basically, basically stem cells coming from the human bone marrow. And we injected these cells, about half a million, in each ovary directly into the uh, ovaries in these experimental animals. Uh, these are the characteristic of the bone marrow st uh, stem cells, mesenchymal stem cells that we used. We got this from a healthy donor, and uh, we made sure that we have the exact specific stem cells that everybody agree. Uh, they have to have a specific markers, and these uh, scientific details, of course, are in the published paper, if you want to refer back to that. And we have seen a lot of improvement. I'm not going to go into all the scientific details, but you see the hormones level in this uh, treated group. This is the group treated with the stem cell, and this is the group with the chemotherapy alone. You see the hormonal level of the treated group with the stem cell start to look like the group that never seen chemotherapy, like the healthy group, which is the blue bar. And we looked at various hormonal profile. We also looked at the histology of the ovary. This is what a normal mouse ovary look like, lots of follicles. And this is the one with the chemotherapy. Basically, nothing is happening there. And then with the stem cell treatment, you see some follicles, some egg activity coming back. And these also looking at the number of follicles. So everything was looking positive in the group treated with the stem cells. And, most and, and then when we look at the stem cells, where do they go and how long do they stay in the, in the mouse ovary, we see that the, the stem cells actually find their way. We inject them just in one spot in the ovary, but they actually home or move around and find their way around the follicles. This kind of uh, fluorescing signal mark the stem cells, and they stay for a long time. We, look, we follow them up to 90 days, and 90 days in a mouse life, that is very long, because the lifespan of a mouse is only two years. So that was very encouraging, but most importantly, these mice treated with the stem cells produced healthy pups. Uh, this is the healthy group, and this is the one with the chemotherapy. They were mostly infertile. And this is the group with the stem cells, and you can see they are almost as good as the healthy group that never seen chemotherapy. And we also looked at the pups, and they looked healthy morphologically. Also the body weight and the weight gain, we followed them for, for uh, 10 days after delivery, and they gain weight in a normal fashion. And we didn't see any other uh, any side effects or complication in these mice. 
So all of these encouraging results uh, and kind of motivated us to, to now think about the first human study. And, uh, and that was a big leap of faith, so we had to work with the FDA, uh, which were very, very thorough. This is the particular office and the individual who really supported, and, and we had wonderful discussion with them. They finally give us the green light, and they understood the urgency of this, uh, that, that these women uh, really need some uh, new and novel uh, thinking about their condition. So we started the first uh, human study. Uh, this is the device we use to isolate the stem cells. Uh, these are uh, FDA-approved device. These are some of the scientific details. But basically, we inject about 5 to 15 million uh, stem cells in the ovary, and the FDA and our local approval bodies wanted us to treat only one ovary and keep the other ovary as a control, as this is a novel uh, uh, treatment, and we wanted to proceed with a lot of caution and, and uh, care. So we called, actually, uh, one of my patients called this study ROSE. It's a, a abbreviation for rejuvenation of the ovary with stem cells. She, uh, she's the one who came up with this name because she kept saying, I want this study that is going to rejuvenate my ovary. And that was very, very uh, touchy and very uh, pleasant. So we called the study ROSE, and we call it ROSE 1 because we expect that there will be uh, improvement and uh, in future study ROSE 2 and ROSE 3. And of course, it's registered on clinicaltrial.gov with all the details that, uh, that you might want to know about. So the design of the study, the, uh, the patient comes to, uh, after, of course, screening and enrollment in the study, she comes to the operating room. And we, under anesthesia, we collect the bone marrow biopsy in a traditional way from the iliac bone. And then we use this device that I just showed you a couple of seconds ago to isolate the stem cells in the OR. It takes about 20 minutes. During that time, we set up the patient for uh, laparoscopy, which, as you know, is a procedure to be able to put a camera in the pelvis so that we can see the ovaries and we can inject the stem cells under vision to make sure they go into the right ovary uh, and not anywhere else. And we go ahead and uh, they inject the stem cells in the right ovary, and we inject normal saline in the left ovary as a control. And then we follow the patients for about a year. And this is just a picture from uh, our first case, uh, the laparoscopic setup. Uh, so, and these are some pictures of uh, the ovary. As you can imagine, the ovaries of these uh, women and these patients are very small because they are not active. They are actually atrophic. So they are very small. They're about one-third the size of a normal ovary. And this is the injection process. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Uh, Prosper here holding the ovary, my assistant, and I'm injecting the stem cells directly into the right ovary. This is doing, and we inject this very slowly to allow the cells to settle down in the ovary and the ovary to expand. It takes about, the injection process itself it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. And then we withdraw and we follow the patient. So, so this is some information about our first patient. Uh, we have about 40 patients enrolled in the study right now, but we have completed only two patients, and several uh, other patients are scheduled uh, for this procedure in the near future. This was a 35 Caucasian woman. She had never been pregnant. And uh, this is some information about her. And uh, she had uh, uh, early, uh, she had Menarche normally, normal cycle, but then uh, uh, about uh, in 2012, she suddenly stopped uh, having period, which is typical for this disease. And then she was diagnosed with uh, premature ovarian failure. Um, no obvious cause, which is typical. Uh, everything else looks normal, no significant medical or surgical history. She, for a religious reason, uh, did not want to go with egg donation, and she wanted to be part of the study. So this is some of her data, um, and uh, as you can see here, the size of the ovary. Remember, the left ovary works as a control. So preoperatively, obviously, the two ovaries were the similar size. The blue is the left ovary, the control ovary injected with normal saline, and the red is the one injected with the stem cells. Right after the uh, injection, about a week, we do ultrasound, transvaginal ultrasound. The picture is here, and uh, you, we see the, the right ovary is larger in size. But we think this is just from the amount of stem cells that we injected. It was temporary. Then the kind of the size kind of balance out. 
But then gradually the right ovary start to grow and stay about uh, at least twice the size of the uh, left ovary up to a year after the study. So that was very encouraging. And uh, actually 2.7 uh, cubic centimeter is approaching the normal uh, size of the ovary, which is about 3 to 3.5. So that was very encouraging results. Then we, of course, followed uh, a lot of hormonal levels in this patient. Most importantly is the estrogen level. Estrogen is the hormone that comes from the ovary, and it's the main hormone that, for example, when you don't have enough of it, you get all these menopausal symptoms and so on. And as you can see, this is the level preoperative, and you see the level goes up and stay up for, again, uh, the end of the study, which is one year. Very interestingly, about seven months in both patients that we have completed so far, the patients start resuming their period, which I can tell you, uh, I got that call actually about 1 a.m. And I'm, I don't know if anybody ever studied if menses usually start uh, uh, during the middle of the night, but I got that call because I gave my cell phone to all, all my patients this study, and they were ecstatic. The first period they had for uh, four years in the first patient and five years in the second patient. They were, they were in tears, and actually I was in tears too. Uh, so, and the level of estrogen uh, continue up to a year, which the end of the study uh, that we follow the patient for. And as expected, of course, with the high estrogen level, uh, the, you see a major improvement in menopausal symptoms, hot flashes, night sweats, mood swings, painful intercourse or dyspareunia, and we use the, uh, na the North American uh, Menopausal Society questionnaire to do that, uh, and we see significant improvement in menopausal symptoms. Second patient uh, had almost exactly similar results. So we are continuing with this. So this is preliminary, but it's very exciting. Both patients are pursuing pregnancy at this point, have not achieved pregnancy to my knowledge, uh, and I'm sure I would know once they do that. Um, but, uh, but we are moving forward. I thought this is very exciting, very encouraging, but we also will continue to improve our methods, particularly what we like to know is what is exactly coming from those stem cells, the growth factors that comes from the stem cells that activate the ovary. Because once we know that, actually that would be a major improvement in the field in general, but then we can actually engineer, we can enhance these stem cells to produce more of those specific factors and we can achieve uh, uh, probably better results. Also, this opens the door for other conditions such as polycystic ovary syndrome and, and other infertility, female infertility challenges. So uh, that's it, and I'd like to thank, of course, my team who are actually present here, funding from NIH and my university and my collaborators. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Furland to come up to the podium. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I present this study uh, that is performed uh, in collaboration between two universities, the University of Padova and the University of Brescia. Uh, I recently moved from the University of Padova to the University of Brescia, so indeed the study is from the University of uh, Padova, but now I lived in this new home in the University of Brescia that or this is two universities as in the north of Italy. So uh, I am the principal investigation by the University of Brescia, uh, University of Padua, sorry. Uh, is, uh, the study was uh, led by Carlo Foresta. Um, we looked at male infertility, and you probably know that infertility is classically defined as uh, uh, absence of pregnancy after one year of uh, unprotected uh, sexual intercourse. Infertility, couple infertility, is uh, uh, a very important uh, uh, prob social problem because uh, it involves about 10-15% of couples. And you can see here from uh, this uh, slide that uh, male factors and female factors uh, are equally distributed in the, as a cause of uh, couple infertility. So about 40% are male factor causes, 40% uh, female, and about 20% of, co of cases uh, are, have both uh, uh, male and female uh, factors. And what about male infertility? 
Um, th this, uh, in this table, you see the main causes of male infertility. Uh, some are uh, very frequent, such as, for example, varicocele uh, or uh, genetic uh, problems, uh, such as uh, Kleinefelter syndrome or Y chromosome microdeletion, and so on, and uh, uh, also uh, seminal infection or history of cryptorchidism, that is, the failure of the testes to normally descend into the scrotum, and so on. Uh, what it is important that uh, for a, a clear diagnosis of male infertility, the main important, uh, the most important important uh, test is a semen analysis that guide us in uh, the diagnosis and uh, treatment and prognosis. But uh, uh, if you want to have a, a full uh, diagnosis and a precise diagnosis of male infertility, you have to perform uh, some other tests such as uh, uh, semen culture and uh, testes and prostate uh, ultrasound examination or karyotype and other genetics analysis and uh, determination of reproductive hormones. So at the end of all these tests, uh, you can have an uh, exact diagnosis of male infertility. And what about semen analysis? Semen analysis, as I said, is uh, the main important uh, test for uh, the diagnosis of male infertility. And semen analysis give you uh, a lot of information about uh, sperm number and sperm quality, such as, for example, motility or sperm morphology, viability, and so on. And uh, uh, what it is important that uh, if you want to have uh, uh, an estimate of the uh, total function of the testicle, uh, you can choose one of these uh, uh, parameters that is a total sperm count. The total sperm count is the number of sperm present in an ejaculate. And for, by definition, by the WHO, uh, we say that a man has oligosospermia if total sperm count is below 39 million sperm per ejaculate. And a normal zoospermia, so normal sperm count when this number is uh, above 39 million per ejaculate. So this number, total sperm count, uh, is the most important uh, uh, parameter to say if the global activity of the test is, uh, is normal or not. And the other thing, the important thing, is that, uh, as said before, uh, the testicle not only produces sperm, but also produces testosterone, and testosterone is under the control of LH, while the production of uh, uh, sperm is under the control of FSH uh, produced by the pituitary gland. So, we have another definition uh, in re regarding male infertility that is hypogonadism. Hypogonadism is uh, low sperm count and low testosterone. So when the testicle is not functioning per, uh, as uh, in normal situation, we have both components of the testicle that go uh, wrong. So low production of uh, sperm and low production of testosterone. What it is important that the, uh, when an uh, infertile man has uh, low testosterone, uh, it may be uh, that other systemic uh, problems could be present because testosterone uh, have, uh, has a number of effects, uh, uh, for example, on the bone or on the muscle or uh, on the uh, weight gain and, uh, gain and so on. So uh, classically, we have three forms of hypogonadism. One is, is, is so-called the primary hypogonadism. So the problem is in the testicle that it does, is, is not functioning perfectly. So testosterone is low and LH is high. Uh, secondary hypogonadism is when the problem is at the pituitary level. So testosterone is low, but uh, LH is low. And the other form is the so-called subclinical hypogonadism, that is a normal testosterone in the presence of height LH. So it is a, a precursor of primary hypogonadism. So uh, the main question of our study was, uh, are semen quality and, in general, reproduction function of a man fun uh, markers of a general male health? Because there, are, there were some studies in the literature showing that infertile men may be at increased risk for some uh, um, other comorbidities. So uh, the study included a total of more than 5,000 men uh, from an initial court of more than 11,000 men. 
And uh, uh, you see that all these uh, 5,000 men had a complete diagnosis of male infertility, including uh, semen analysis, semen culture, reproductive hormone, biochemical data, especially for lipid and glucose metabolism, and testis ultrasign. And when there is hypogonadism, so low testosterone, as I said before, these uh, men also uh, undergo bone density analysis, bone scan for, uh, for discover uh, low bone mass and osteoporosis. Uh, you can see here, this number is the total sperm count, as I said before. Uh, so uh, uh, you can look uh, just at this number. You see that we have uh, an equal number, about 50% of men with low sperm count and about 50% with uh, normal zoospermia. So we then compare these two main populations uh, of men with oligozoospermia and normal zoospermia. The first data is this, so the prevalence of hypogonadism as uh, I uh, defined it before. And you see here the different form of primary hypogonadism, secondary hypogonadism, and subclinical hypogonadism. What it is important is that in general, men with low sperm count have a 45% uh, prevalence of hypogonadism uh, with respect of 6% in men with normal zoospermia. So this is very important because at the end, uh, if we have a statistical analysis, we can say that the risk for hypogonadism in men with total sperm count below 39 million is 12. So uh, there is a, uh, about a 12 higher fold uh, increased risk of having hypogonadism. Even if you can see that the most of these men have the so-called subclinical hypogonadism, so testosterone is still in the normal range, but we have higher LH levels. Uh, uh, what uh, the next data is this complex table, uh, table but uh, I have uh, uh, here put the main findings. Uh, when we compare men with low sperm count with respect to men with normal sperm, ca sperm count, what did we find? Uh, we found that uh, men with low sperm count have a greater body fat, uh, represented by higher body mass index and waist circumference, and higher blood pressure, higher LDL cholesterol and uh, triglyceride, lower HDL cholesterol, and higher insulin resistance that is, uh, uh, as you know, a form of uh, pre-diabetic, uh, pre-diabetes. So all this data indicates that men with low sperm count have an increased um, risk for cardio or have an increased uh, have parameters uh, showing an increased cardiovascular and metabolic uh, risk. So at the end, statistical analysis show that men with low sperm count have a 25% higher risk of metabolic syndrome that is uh, a combination of uh, this uh, cardiovascular uh, met and metabolic uh, uh, risk factors. Uh, what it is important, uh, the, 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 last, uh, the last important finding is if we exclude uh, the influence of uh, hypogonadism, so we compare among patients with low sperm count, uh, uh, excuse me, with normal testosterone levels, those with low sperm count and normal sperm count, we found uh, similar results. So. Uh, namely that men with low sperm count has greater body fat, higher blood pressure, low HDL cholesterol, and higher insulin resistance. So what this data means? means that uh, obviously testosterone is important, but also in general men with low sperm count um, have uh, an increased risk for cardiovascular and uh, metabolic uh, problems. So we can see that uh, low sperm count uh, per se, so uh, of itself, is uh, a marker or is associated with uh, poorer measures of uh, cardiometabolic health. And uh, uh, finally, I said before that men with hypogonadism underwent a bone density scan, and these are the results. You see that young infertile men with hypogonadism have 35% prevalence of osteopenia, that is a reduced bone density, but not so 
uh, bad uh, as uh, osteoporosis, that is uh, the most severe form of uh, low bone density that is present in 17% uh, uh, of patients with hypogonadism. So about uh, uh, half of the men, young men, because uh, you remember these are men in fertile age, they are about 30 years of age, have uh, a higher risk of uh, low bone mass and uh, osteopenia and osteoporosis. So in conclusion, uh, we say that men with low sperm count have a 12-fold increased risk of uh, having hypogonadism, and men with uh, low sperm count has uh, a poorer cardiometabolic uh, um, uh, profile, uh, with uh, higher body fat, uh, systolic pressure, LDL, triglyceride, and insulin resistance, and lower HDL cholesterol. So, uh, in one word, they have a higher risk of metabolic syndrome. And uh, low sperm count uh, of itself is uh, associated with poorer metabolic uh, uh, parameter, and men with hypogonadism have a higher risk, uh, a higher prevalence of. Uh, uh, low bone uh, mineral density represented by osteopenia and osteoporosis. So this is the largest study performed today because I said these are more than 5,000 uh, um, men, infertile men, so this is the largest study performed to date showing that low sperm count of itself is a marker of general health. It is important to note that uh, we cannot say that low sperm count uh, is the cause of uh, uh, poorer metabolic uh, uh, profile. The, these two conditions are uh, associated, or best we can say that the low sperm count is the marker of general male health. And what is this important from a clinical point of view? It is important because uh, these men uh, who have uh, 30 years old, are 30 years old, have, I think, the unique opportunity um, to, uh, for health assessment and prevention, disease prevention. And also, uh, you know that uh, in many countries, uh, uh, not only in Italy where I live, but also here in the U.S., the treatment of male infertility is often, often limited to having a child, uh, mainly by in vitro fertilization techniques and so on. Uh, what this study show is that uh, infertile men should be uh, correctly diagnosed and uh, uh, should uh, have a, a general health assessment other than just a semen analysis or IVF treatment. So I think this is uh, the most uh, practical, important uh, uh, consequence of uh, our large study, and uh, I thank you for the attention. Thank you, Dr. Furland. We're now going to open up the question and answer session. Again, please speak into the microphone if you have a question. My question is for uh, Stephanie Dipage. Uh, uh, could you please identify yourself and uh, what yeah, institution uh, you're representing? I'm, I'm AJ Landalusi from UIC University. Uh, my question is uh, regarding the pill. Uh, do you have any idea about the risk that the patient they will be exposed to develop metabolic uh, diseases or disorder due to the decrease of the testosterone level? Uh, so the question about uh, increased risk of metabolic consequences with taking dimethandrolone or another pill. Um, so we don't know from this study, this study was too short in order to be able to determine those things. Um, the, the point here with the dimethandrolone and with any male pill is that despite the fact that we're lowering the man's testosterone, the hormones that are provided are working at the same, at the androgen receptor. So they are providing the androgen or testosterone that we're taking away in the form that we're giving it. So the question is an important one. We know that testosterone is really important for maintaining lean body mass and for cholesterol, as I talked about before. And all those things, of course, contribute to insulin resistance and long-term cardiovascular disease. So those are really important questions. In studies of this length, we can't determine that, of course. But we're very encouraged that the, even though the testosterone levels are low, there weren't significant effects of low testosterone. So um, 
you're, it's an important point that we'll, all along the way in the development of the male pill, we'll be assessing parameters that are associated with the metabolic syndrome and metabolic risk. Blood pressure, lipids, uh, eventually, we look at glucose every time they come in. There were no signals for fasting glucose in this study. So those will be important questions, but I can't give you an answer right now. Uh, Ed Sussman with my page today. Also with Dr. Page, um, is there any types of food um, can be, you know, you said pills has sure. to be taken with a meal. Are there any meal, any particular meal, types of meals? So that's a good question. So the question is what kind of food needs to be taken with the, this. So this is a prototype. When you do drug development, the FDA actually uh, has guidelines about what a meal contains in terms of fat content. So in the initial studies we did, they actually had to be quite a high fat meal. In this particular study, they needed to have 25 to 30 grams of fat. That's what we recommended. We gave them a list of foods to allow them to construct a breakfast that would uh, have those characteristics. And when they came into the clinic for their dosing, which was twice a week, because that's when we did other uh, parameters, we actually gave them a shake and a meal that was appropriate. We don't know that that amount of fat is necessary for absorption of the drug because we haven't tested it. So as we move along in development, we'll be loosening probably the, the requirements. But they will. there is no question that food has to be taken in order to optimize the absorption. And um, I know the study that you're reporting was for 28 days. Mm -hmm. um, have you done further work now that extends that time longer than 28 days? We're just about to start. So we're going to be starting the, that study. We have IRB approval, so we'll be starting that next month. That's going to be a three-month study. Will, will it be with the same group or different? No, new people, new volunteers. There's a lot of interest, so we we'll have <laughs> lots of healthy volunteers. Miriam Tucker with Medscape. Um, Dr. Furlan, are you suggesting that um, sperm count should be a routine lab test for all male patients? And if so, what, what does it offer beyond the routine, you know, cholesterol, blood pressure, blood sugar tests? Yes, it's very, very interesting, your, <laughs> your question. Uh, I really think that uh, uh, semen analysis could be um, uh, a test that could uh, have in, um, give us information about the general health of a man. So I think uh, if uh, every man at uh, 18 years old, 20 years old, have a sperm analysis, uh, we could have information about his, uh, not only his prognosis or for fertility, but in general for uh, his uh, general health. But you know, it is not possible to have a screening <laughs> of all patients or, or all uh, uh, men with uh, a semen analysis. But for example, um, in Italy, uh, there is a lot of uh, prevention for fertility problems. And for example, uh, we have such a screening for uh, men uh, 18 years old in the higher school in the, the last year of the high school, and uh, uh, we screen with semen analysis, uh, not in our city, not in all, in the, in all, uh, in the entire Italy. And we have some uh, very important information because, you know, at 18 years old, about 20% of boys have uh, uh, some uh, problems with uh, semen analysis. So uh, it is different to have this information at 20 years old uh, rather than at uh, 40 years old when this man could try to have a child. So uh, we, we cannot propose the semen analysis as a general screening, but it could give us important information, yes. Thank you so much to everyone who attended today's news conference. Um, to catch recordings, you can tune into endowebcasting.com. Thank you.